Okay, great. So welcome everyone. Uh, today's speaker, Ashley O'Kane, uh, former Uclicker, did uh, her PhD here working with Anne Blanford um, and is now at University of Bristol. And uh, really looking forward to hearing this talk about digital health and care. I think that's all I'm going to say. Over to you, Ashley. Thanks for coming. Yeah, and the rest of the, the title, The Context for Real World Impact. So yeah, I am a former um, new clicker. Uh, I'm going to give you a very, very basic history. I'm actually a human factors engineer by uh, my undergraduates, um, and I slowly moved into um, HCI through a master's um, and then into healthcare. Um, and I was at UCLIC for my PhD with um, Anne Blanford as my supervisor and Yvonne Rogers. And I, I stayed on for uh, a little bit more, as long as, long as I could, um, for a, a, a fellowship um, on DIY diabetes tech. Uh, so there's familiar faces in the room and uh, uh, familiar faces at UCLIC. So I'm a, a very proud uh, former UCLICer and bother UCL as much as possible. Um, I'm currently an associate prof of human computer interaction for health at Bristol, um, and I focus on health and care. Um, but in my former life, was it really interesting human factors engineering. My former life, I worked for nuclear safety, and I had to deal a lot with a lot of ISO standards. And indeed, when I started at UCLIC um, as part of the EPSRC uh, CHIMED project, I was also interested in, in ISO standards, part of human error. And um, this one is about medical devices and context. So uh, it, it's it's not just me banging on about context, it's um, uh, international standards organizations who want you to think about the location, the presence of others, other technical devices, the cleanliness of your devices, what conditions they're going to be used in, what other things are happening at the same time where these medical devices are used, for health and care, and sometimes in safety critical situations. Um, what is context? Um, it refers to the physical and social situation in which computational devices are embedded. Um, and I got really interested in the impact of context during my PhD um, and looking at the kind of situatedness of actions based on context, because as much as you can plan for a, a, a perfect action, a plan for what you want to do, it does not always lead to uh, what happens in reality. You can plan to make uh, uh, Xerox sheets of something, but you end up kicking the machine because it didn't work. That wasn't in the plan. Where, when, how these devices are used should be explored because the context impacts the use of the device and therefore should impact the design of these devices. Um, and this is no different for health technology. Um, especially um, health technologies that are used out of contained and a little bit more controlled clinical context. And we all know that clinical contexts aren't that controlled and are incredibly complex. Um, but real life and outside of those workplaces is, is, is very weird as well. So you could be using a medical device, self-manage your type one diabetes, but you could be doing it um, beside your laptop. You could be doing it at a red light or you could be doing it at a dive bar same device used in the same way, but in very, very different contexts. And health contexts are completely complex because um, there are medical aspects of health. Um, you can have discordant uh, chronic conditions, um, depression, anxiety drugs that work against each other. There are very private aspects of health. Uh, stigma is a big thing around many health conditions such as HIV. There are visible aspects of health that influence the way that we engage uh, with health and care. Um, for instance, very visible aspects such as a worn colostomy bag. There's the relentless mental pressures of health, especially with chronic conditions. You can have burnout with self-care. People of type one say they have to engage with this all day, every day. And people have different life circumstances. People um, have different digital literacies, health literacies, different caring responsibilities, different uh, financial concerns. And honestly, people are weird. Everyday experiences influences choices. Um, uh, if, you're, if you're someone who does ultra marathons, that's gonna influence your health tech. Obviously that's not me. If you do martial arts, perhaps you're not um, uh, adopting an insulin pump because that's where you get kicked. And it's important to understand how these devices are adopted, used, not used, and indeed abused in the real world, in the context, because understanding context can inform the design of health and care tech. 
So what aspects of these contexts might influence medical advice design? Um, and this is where uh, it's very important. Um, there are huge amounts of technology opportunities uh, for digital health and care. Um, and it is the single most important and expensive thing that societies do. Um, you don't have to look further than the NHS and their $282 billion um, uh, uh, funding and it being the largest, uh, UK's largest employer and in the world is quite a large employer as well. Um, with the explosion of chronic health conditions with aging populations worldwide, we're not seeing these uh, numbers go down or the importance go down. So we need to look for opportunities for technology to alleviate these constraints. And people have been doing that. People have been doing that a lot. Um, uh, uh, research world has been doing that. The commercial world has been doing that. Uh, people themselves are doing it for themselves as well. Um, and one of the big things, of course, is the move uh, towards automating aspects of our, our health and care and automating aspects of different parts of our lives uh, through artificial intelligence. Um, and there's huge amounts of opportunity here. And I wanna point you to the bottom right-hand corner, which is where I kind of work. Um, type one diabetes is ripe for the picking for um, uh, expert systems, really. Uh, essentially, the pancreas does not produce not sufficient insulin to balance blood, and people have to balance their blood glucose levels using a mixture of different medicines, uh, usually insulin, and technology such as glucose meters and insulin pumps and smartwatches and diet, millions of diabetes apps. Um, and theoretically, isn't that great? We can we can just automate the the CGM, the co continuous glucose monitor, to monitor what your blood sugar is, and then you can dose them with uh, insulin pump. But the real world is complex, and everything impacts self care. Everything impacts your blood, blood glucose levels, food, exercise, stress. I talked to a woman two weeks ago who has to dose her son dependent on which video game he's playing. Not that he is playing video games, but certain video games will um, impact his medical care in a, a different way. Um, but in, in this way, life is quite weird. Um, and there is the possibility for tech. There's a possibility for AI. Um, and it would make massive difference to a lot of people's lives to be able to automate aspects that are kind of going on in the back of their heads 24-7 um, or the back of their parents' heads 24-7. So we do look to AI for this. And uh, naively, this is, this is my thing for AI to support type 1 diabetes management. You get data from the real world, you get data from technology, you get data from the community, you put it into a machine learning pipeline comes out with personal benefits, it feeds back into the, the community, all very good. Um, and this isn't just my naive impression. There's a, quite a lot of startups working in this space, but a lot of diabetes apps if um, anyone wants to lose money when investing. Um, and this work, we were looking at where could machine learnings for diabetes help? And uh, we were working with two former you clickers, um, Amid and uh, Kathy on this work. Um, and we had this idea, this initial focus on the everyday, because type one diabetes is relentless. Let's let's try to remove some of some of that burden, um, some of those heuristics. Let's off offload them onto um, technology. Um, and we did uh, co-design. Um, I think over fifteen workshops with adults with type one diabetes in Bristol to explore this area. Um, and what we found is that. It was a bit of a naive thing coming in and saying, "Well, let's 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 sort out the everyday." That's not where people wanted their uh, the help from. They didn't want help with the routine. They did not want technology to take over routines that they have been engaged with for years and were comfortable with. Um, and they had strong personal heuristics there. There was no need for decision support. There was no need for automation in, the, in these kinds of contexts where they really really needed help was when it became a little bit more unex unexpected, when it became a little bit more non-routine. Um, and they needed, uh, when they knew the routines were changing, they needed decision support. When uh, they didn't have uh, good heuristics for what 
would happen if they, they were traveling. They needed um, uh, health with decision support. Um, when they found themselves in situations where they, they had never experienced this before, this is where automation could help. But of course, there's data issues with that. Um, so we were looking at uh, uh, these data issues by examining a specific time in someone's life, um, in a life transition, because you can have a very routine life um, and have perhaps eat very similar things every day, go to work, have maybe quite regular weekends, but sometimes life throws something at you and your life changes, whether you get another chronic condition, perhaps you move country. Um, in this case, we were looking at um, people leaving their family homes um, and the transition of young people going to university. At that time in people's lives is usually some of the worst outcomes for type one diabetes management because their lives are thrown upside down, food changes, their social lives change, they, uh, uh, their exercise changes. Um, and we were looking at this in the UK context. So their drinking and their dancing changed quite significantly. Um, and their schedules and routines were all over the place. Their social support was not there anymore. Uh, any kind of shared care they shared with their parents was not there anymore. Um, and there are possibilities though for, for, for overcoming these kind of huge transitions where uh, any kind of uh, machine learning algorithm trained on a, a data set uh, would not work anymore because the, the context has completely changed it. But there is there are AI possibilities uh, that would help um, with these kind of immediate difficulties with new experiences and um, also uh, kind of scaffolding the new learning and relearning that has to happen around self-care in this completely new context that people find themselves in. Um, and we're looking towards how do you engage people more in, in these kinds of decisions. And this is work again with you clickers, um, Ka uh, Kathy and Amid, um, towards co-design co machine learning for diabetes. Um, so we, with these workshops, we're looking at end users as equal members of a design team. But this design team, which involved uh, uh, a uh, industry, HCI experts, um, AI nerds, and people with the uh, expertise, the lived experience, people with type 1 diabetes, there were issues there. There were organizational issues and how do you directly feed this into design processes um, that are not just a, a research design process, but a commercial design process. There's huge translational issues. Um, with the different backgrounds of co-designers and getting them all on the same um, uh, same level of understanding and uh, communicating this way the same way. There's also pragmatic design challenges around a huge effort of collecting manual log data for uh, this uh, near future machine learning help that you might be getting, but before any kind of personal benefit can be realized. Um, we, we look to prioritize mutual learning and get the benefit of participation itself, uh, not just uh, 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 the, the, the benefit of actually participating in the co-design, not just relying on the benefit of the end result, the output. Um, and it's clear that we need to align lived self-care experience with scientific machine learning explorations. We're also looking at different ways of engaging people um, with kind of the first basic steps of designing machine learning algorithms, design, um, engaging with AI in health and care technologies. Um, so we, uh, uh, we used a uh, computational tool, uh, specifically a computational notebook called Jupyter, as not just what the data scientists would use, but actually as a co-design tool, as a way to um, do user-centered design with clinicians and carers for uh, a machine learning enhanced risk score, a machine learning enhanced risk score um, based on a public data set. Um, and we use this with a range of um, uh, carers with clinicians and with pe young people with type one diabetes. 
We found it was a really powerful tool for starting and directing discussion, supporting individual ideas and collective co-design and addressing stigma. It is, was still very technical and not that user-friendly. We didn't do anything to the Jupyter Notebook itself or its uh, interactions. Um, and we did make it very beautiful, I can tell you, but, uh, but it, it has these bright spots. It, it could support the learning of machine learning co um, concepts and our least technical participants still by the end were engaged in coding. Um, so there, the, there is definitely a, a bright spot there for kind of taking some of the uh, data science tools, some of these tools that we assume that only nerds can use and reappropriating them for um, uh, doing part more participatory uh, approaches to design and machine learning and AI. Um, so I've just presented some work that we, we've published. We're still working in this space though, um, kind of user-driven approaches to AI. So uh, Sam James, a PhD student here, is looking towards co-designing um, to integrate any smartwatch data into artificial pancreas systems with young people with type 1 diabetes, which is an interesting take because usually it's a use the Apple Watch, put it into um, uh, the Medtronic uh, uh, artificial pancreas system. And instead, Sam's um, trying to engage in the real world use of smartwatches, which is a, a bit more varied than that. Um, and uh, looking to co-design with people on these kind of uh, closed loop systems. Uh, PhD student Tim, um, he is looking at co-designing over WhatsApp. And um, this is to try to engage people uh, that wouldn't normally be able to uh, maybe engage in technology design. Um, and he's working with people with type 1 diabetes in Nigeria. And um, WhatsApp, uh, after en engaging in an interview study, in person and over WhatsApp is now looking at to leverage that technology, which is very common technology used worldwide um, to develop shared care technology solutions. And we're just kicking off the EPSRC Taurus project, um, looking to co-design human AI interactions for a smart home to support clinical trials for Parkinson's medication as well. That's kind of the digital health side of the talk. I'm gonna switch a little bit to the, the digital care because there are many opportunities for innovation in healthcare with technologies. Um, and there are many complexities around context of health. So engaging with these, uh, these contexts, understanding them, as well as engaging users in the design very early can help overcome some of these contexts and bring out these weird aspects of life into the design of these technologies that exist in our weird lives. Um, but similarly, there are many opportunities for technologies to provide care. Much, much of my work is focused on self-care um, and um, uh, uh, with you and fin finishing his PhD at Bristol, very much focused on shared care and informal care. Um, I, I think there's also huge opportunities for technology to support social care. In the US, you call this public health, wouldn't be as well supported. Uh, but in the UK, we call it uh, social care. It's often the responsibility of councils rather than the NHS. So Bristol City Council provides um, a, a technology enabled care solutions uh, to people who live in Bristol. Um, and they are broke <laughs> like many other councils because of uh, a huge number of people who, who need their help and uh, they are often looking for these technology solutions to reduce the costs because there's a huge social care funding gap. Um, public spending on social care is not what it needs to be in order to actually provide that care for people in need. Um, and so there is this push, this push to shift care to domestic settings. Um, as it, as it, the, the social care needs rise with the growing aging population. And it is a bit of a mess actually how it's provided. So councils do a bit of social care. NHS does a little bit of social care. There are over 20,000 organizations providing social care services in the UK and a huge billion pound gap, a uh, huge 18 billion pound gap between need and funding. Um, if you're looking at uh, the actual provision of social care, there is a huge rate of turnover for formal carers. They are not paid very well. There's huge, huge high vacancy rates as well. 
So as you can imagine, people are turning towards care and this move towards technology enabled care programs. Um, the NHS really wants them to allow for care outside of formal settings um, that is convenient, accessible and, and cost effective. Um, the lived expect, uh, experience and context of care though is, sh is shifting as well. So th there's this idea on the left-hand side is this is what care is, it's a, it's a professional helping. The reality of care is, is not that. Um, even people with long-term conditions, people who are heavy users of the health service are likely to spend only 1% of their time in contact with health professionals. The rest of the time they're with their carers and the families they manage on their own. If you actually costed people's time providing this kind of care work, and one in eight people in the UK are informal carers, the amount of time spent is estimated to be larger than the NHS budget. This is uncosted time. This is a uh, time that is uh, not well supported uh, publicly and comes out of people's pockets and is a huge uh, impact on the economy at large. So we're looking at the move to domestic technologies in order to support this health and care. And there are huge opportunities for low cost technologies for health and care. Um, however, homes are interesting contexts. Um, again, looking at a hospital, quite uncontrolled, very complex as well. But homes are, are a social communal settings. They're physical and spatial settings. They're personal spaces. They have legacy technologies, they have structures, they have memories, um, they, uh, and they're, they are not, um, they're not consistent in any way. And uh, over time, they change as well. Um, and what is the home context? Often, when talking about it, homes, it's, you might see pictures such as these, which were stolen off of, I think, mostly right move. There's a few mid-century houses there as well. Um, but the reality of that is, is that, that, that that is one way of looking at it. That is a streamlined and idealized vision of what a home is, often a stereotypical home, a North American single family detached home occupied by parents with children. And homes are not that. Homes are all over the place. I had a PhD student who was, is living, was living in a van. Um, I have a colleague who's currently living on a boat. Um, my husband lived in a tent as he finished his PhD. These were their homes at the time, currently, um, and uh, that that's, is hard to design for compared to the idealized single family. Um, so for technology enabled care at home, we need to be able to provide care outside of clinical settings. It is incredibly important, but it's an incredibly complex uh, um, task to do because the home is a very complex context. But this isn't just an opportunity. This is a necessity given the financial and time constraints, both for, for the NHS, for uh, public spend on social care, but also for the families involved and, um, and um, neighbors and friends who are providing these, these uh, uh, caring duties. As part of um, a, a fairly sizable grant uh, is Sphere Next Steps, which was uh, based at Bristol. Um, the aim was to develop this smart home of the future to impact a range of healthcare needs simultaneously by employing data fusion and pattern recognition from a common platform of largely non-medical environmental network sensors and home environment. Um, and it was pretty complex and they did a lot of uh, uh, engineering around this. The electrical engineers and the AI nerds went wild. Um, they got a lot of computer vision involving um, and engaging in quite privately, uh, uh, standing still, uh, uh, vacuuming, cooking, uh, falls. They had a wearable that they developed, they had environmental sensors, they had gateway devices. Um, they were able to, to do huge amounts of uh, sensing with very low cost technologies and had huge engineering advances um, and data fusion advances as part of this project. Um, but what about the residents? Um, and we came in, we were quite interested in how these domestic technologies interact with the social care and community dynamics that are part of these homes. 
Um, how are current home tech health technologies used by the wider household? How are consumer uh, smart homes accepted and used in the wider household? How do you co-design and explain complicated machine learning IoT systems for care? Um, and I'm bringing up Ewan's work here. So uh, uh, Ewan, uh, along with uh, Amid, who was a uh, co-supervisor on this work um, on aging in place. Um, and we couldn't really look at a, a smart home, a high tech smart home system that was deployed and appropriated and adopted and had a, a way through. So um, uh, uh, the NHS or social care, it didn't really exist at the time. So we looked to something else. We were interested in how will obtrusive smart home technology be accepted and adopted by families. Couldn't study that. So instead, we studied something that existed, was appropriated. How are stair lifts for mobility accepted and uh, adopted by families? Uh, in collaboration with Bristol City Council and a couple of charities, we, uh, Ewan did the interviews, folks do different observation studies to understand the adoption journey. Um, and it was quite the emotional journey. Um, Ewan has quite a few stories from, from, from this first study of his PhD. Um, and it wasn't just a matter of, I have mobility issues, I'm gonna get a stair lift solved, um, which is how the planners around technology enable care, how the providers and the payers around technology enable care um, uh, uh, framed this. But the reality of it was this incredibly complex journey that was incredibly emotional people who had been the care of their family their entire lives didn't want to give in. There were so many tears in order to get people to the point of accepting the idea or even that they had surrendered to the idea of having this in their house. Um, and in, in a sense, rooting their house as well stair a stairway is is usually a focal part in, in if you have a, a, a two-story apartment or home uh, having a stair lift and it does change the aesthetic of the house um you have to accept that you your mobility has gone to the point you have to accept your mobility is not going to get better um and this is is it involved a lot of crying but it involves this emotional journey towards a relief as well and the, the acceptance that it was the right decision. On the left-hand side is the model of how stair lifts should be adopted. This is how the occupational therapists saw how stair lifts should, uh, were adopted, accepted and used. This is how the private installers of stair lifts thought that uh, uh, stair lifts would be adopted, accepted and used. And the reality that Ewan uncovered was these steps of decision-making, of conflict and trauma, with getting grandchildren to, to guilt grandparents into getting these stair lifts. And this uh, final final relief, catharsis, catharsis and uh, independence. And it was a huge mess of emotions for the, the person getting the stair lift, but it was a huge mess for everyone else as well. Their live-in spouse and adult children, anyone else who lived in the house, neighbors and friends, um, uh, clinicians um, and uh, all of these people had this impact on this emotional journey towards the final acceptance of the and adoption of the stair lift. But even then, that's still a complex story because, uh, much like other technologies, uh, for instance, hearing aids, um, just, even if they're uh, they're given to a person, that doesn't mean they can they use it. And there are still stories of people getting these stair lifts in their homes and continuing to crawl up and down the stairs. Um, people get a hearing aids and only one in 40 people end up using hearing aids. It doesn't, it isn't the end of it. Um, people are complex and we have complex lives and, and personalities and choices. And so uh, this kind of straightforward journey towards acceptance is not straightforward at all. We also looked towards, so this we, um, even you and myself and uh, a few other um, people on the Sierra Project, we're also looking towards commercial technologies um, for care. And this was uh, looking towards a, a specific commercial technology, Alexa Show. Um, and we were able to do this during the first COVID lockdown, giving out uh, these devices to 11 households 
with uh, older adults um, and talking to the, these primary users, but also their adult children and how they used it. Um, and uh, I, I sound, often sound like I work for Amazon, but Amazon never gives me any money. So I do not work for Amazon, but it was uh, very surprising how well these little, quite cheap devices were appropriated for health and care and particularly well-being. Uh, we have an adult child calling the, the device a lifesaver. It's now part of the family. Um, uh, reducing the panic calls of um, their 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 mother. Um, we have people using it for uh, social engagements over the lockdown, uh, activities that they wouldn't have been able to do um, because of uh, shielding, because they're older adults. They're able to engage in these kind of virtual shopping um, things. Not that it was successful for virtual shopping, but that wasn't the point. They were engaging with their son with it. Um, we also had people just take it up, take it on and and roll with it and coming back after the three months and they had developed their own skills um, and it was very much uh, a part of their home. We saw that the Echo Show was being used as a care and social facilitator. Um, it wasn't it wasn't a person. It wasn't a person in the house, although they would scream at her. Um, it was more like a mediator. It did have, of course, its clinical limitations, but there is possibilities for health and care uh, automation. Um, and it was a social intermediator. It allowed for interpersonal experiences, a little bit of sort of social tension as well. But I, I again, sound like I work for Amazon, but it was a source of well-being and care. I'd like to point out a source of dignity too. There's an echo show in that the background here. It does not look like a care device. Um, I currently have one in my kitchen. We do not use it as a care device, although it's a source of social tension as well. Um, it is a, a commercial device that is can be appropriate for health and care and has very little stigma attached to it if you ignore all the privacy concerns. Um, we also, as part of the Sphere project, looked at how do you go towards co-designing care smart homes? There is a clear need for engaging with a variety of uh, stakeholders. However, smart homes are incredibly complex. Um, even the smart, the, the smartest sphere experts that built and worked on the system for a year did not know everything about the system. Um, and so how do you get to the point of getting people at a design table to, to, to participate in the co-design of something that is so complex that even the experts don't understand it? Um, so we were looking at how do you get people on kind of the level playing fields to be able to even sit down to do co-design. Co so looking at user-centered approaches before the co-design to create a companion book to uh, understand the, the, the limits of the system, but also the opportunities for it. Um, and as part of that, uh, how do we get people to understand such a complex system that's going to be in their house, collecting quite sensitive information for good reason, health and care. Um, but after the system is ready to deploy, the, the, the need for explanation is it only grows. Um, informed consent is a key in the medical field and for GDPR. So how are you able to explain complex machine learning IOT systems for health and care in, in, in lay terms? And we explored this with the experts and explored this with people with uh, type two diabetes, um, because it is a necessary step before adoption that you have this explanation of this complex system. There's still quite a lot of work to be done around explanation of complex systems. We just uh, finished some work looking at heat pumps, nothing to do with health and care really, but uh, even the early adopter, middle-class, quite well-off, absolute nerds who are adopting these heat pump systems have no idea how it works and how uh, how to actually control these systems. So it, it isn't just in health and care, but the, these complex systems that are coming into our homes and our lives, it's incredibly important that we know what we're signing up for. So for care though, who pays? How do we scale this? Public care has been moving toward private services. Um, it has to, if you have uh, over 25,000 pounds in savings, uh, that's you not getting social care. 
So that is not necessarily a person that is incredibly well off, but now they have to pay for um, technology enabled care devices. Um, and there is this contrast with this kind of dependence on the government versus independence and self-care that motivates people. Um, most people pay out of pocket for their own care and for the family's care. And increasingly they're paying for these care technologies. And the commercial companies are jumping on this. This is these are uh, uh, this is from websites for a commercial company. The they are using uh, emotional language in order to get, uh, empty your pockets. Uh, for your loved one, for your loved ones, you'll pay this twenty four seven peace of mind. Um, for only as little as a pound a day, um, you get to 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 provide this care. Um, if you loved your loved ones, you you will you you actually pay more upfront to get all of these additional sensors because you really really want to have an eye on them. You really really care about them. You really really love them. And in fact, if you have how about these add-ons for your smart home? Because um, who who can cost the love of a parent who brought you up and reared you? Um, but what they're selling is an idealized world. What is the real world um, when you actually put these commercial smart home technologies in the home? We studied one. Um, it was a research one uh, with uh, you clicker, Ewan. Um, and uh, these are people that uh, would not have qualified mostly for social care enabled devices. Um, they can't get anything off the state. They have to pay for everything. So this might be a technology that they would engage with because um, of care needs for older adults. Um, so uh, there was a, we did a critical discourse analysis on the onboarding and marketing material and three months of use of commercial smart home device, um, as well as three months of uh, usage with five households and uh, the adult children who provided care. But were we onboarding peace of mind? Um, that that's what it was sold they thought before they got the device that their fall pendant they'd be able to throw it out perhaps they can get rid of this and then they actually engaged with it and realized that they couldn't um they found that this peace of mind came with giving over complete control uh to the company um these expectations set by onboarding of relief were not met um, and in fact more care labor and less control was de described by all households um you and looked at this care labor um, and it there wasn't theoretically it uh, these health and care technologies are supposed to relieve the burden um, but there was an increase in care labor not a decrease um, huge amounts of learning and set up work people coming from the north of the uk to the south to set up these systems for people um, the maintenance work to keep these things working um, engaging with the dashboard, um, dealing with uh, the data work um, to get that dashboard working and storing the right data. Huge amounts of care work was in increased by using this. Um, so uh, uh, knowing something was wrong and the device not being able to communicate that with the clinician caused additional work. And of course, there's the, the, the emotional work that comes with it. Um, it, it, it's, it, it caused people to phone their adult children and their adult children trying to take them off the let. Hey, don't worry, uh, you don't need to worry about this. You don't need to worry about that. It, it's okay. So this like peace of mind device created more labor for people. Um, we're still working on the, the, and I still have a lot of faith for the, the use of commercial technologies for care. Um, so Elaine Check, who did the critical discourse analysis, was looking at uh, the use of Echo Show in further, not just older adult households, but diverse households in receipt of social care. Uh, Rachel Keyes is a PhD student. She's looking at the use of smartwatches and the self-diagnosis, self-management of cardiac conditions. And we're still working on this, um, looking at the real world of uh, parent-child interactions through commercial technologies with the ESRC Social Digital Futures Center. But I'm going to be wrapping this up. Um, so digital health and care and the, the context for real world impact. Um, there's, of course, a need for technologies to alleviate pressure in health and care systems. We all know that. 
Uh, we all know the headlines about the NHS. We all know the headlines about social care. But this also includes personal care networks, such as families, and also personal responsibility for self-care. Um, huge opportunities exist. Um, I, I am particularly excited for the possibilities around AI and for technologies in domestic city, uh, settings and mobile technologies that keep people out of clinical settings, which are quite expensive, yes, but also people don't want to be in clinical settings. Um, no, no one loves a hospital trip. Um, and health and care provision is complex. The context in which health and care is provided is complex. People's circumstances are incredibly different. Um, people's homes are very different. People are weird. Um, and unfortunately, these very complex contexts impacts the success of an intervention. Um, you can have the best plan for a, a digital intervention, but you send it out into the world and um, it becomes a paperweight because it doesn't fit into people's homes. Um, and technologists and designers must account for these complex contexts in design through both understanding them prior to designing, understanding them after the design and the implementation of them, but also by engaging people early, engaging the end users, the complex end users, not just the primary users of these devices, but um, the all stakeholders in the co-design um, with these devices. And with that, um, thank you very much. And I'll answer any questions. And I have some ways to contact me, but actually uh, uh, maybe just bother Paul Marshall. I'm gonna be on maternity leave <laughs> very soon until October, 2024. But thank you very much for having me and very sorry I couldn't come in person.